it's humbling to hear how intelligent slime mold is. We're not exceptional. And it's important to us as biosemioticians to show that semiosis can occur in organisms that don't have a brain at all. So can a computer be creative? Uh, the next Rembrandt project is a much celebrated example of a deep learning algorithm used to, quote, bring the artist back to life to paint one more painting. The computer generated portrait here does mimic a Rembrandt pretty well. To accomplish this, the programmers had to train the algorithm on Rembrandt's paintings. And because machine learning requires a lot of data, they selected the most common type of painting that he did. These are some of Rembrandt's commissioned work, not his best, most creative work, which the programmers ended up using for their data set. Um, using facial recognition software, they created the average eye, nose, and lips. And they claimed that in this way, they quote, abstracted the features that made Rembrandt Rembrandt. After receiving some corrective feedback from painting experts, which is good, they got some useful back propagation, the portrait was printed out. Here's the fake Rembrandt compared to a few of Rembrandt's non-hack work. And this is a painting done by a student in the Rembrandt school, which was mistaken for Rembrandt by scholars for many years. Old woman cutting her nails goes beyond what is merely skillful. And it's more interesting than the many portraits that were used to train the AI. We can say that this artist was taught the Rembrandt style, but he was able to execute it in an original way. The next Rembrandt program programmers, I think, don't understand what creativity is. And so they produced a mediocre painting on purpose and they spent millions of dollars to do it. <laughs> Computers can be really good at producing formulaic art. This is a program that can render any photo into a Van Gogh Starry Night style to the extent that it's easy to find a formula for a style and put it into an app, we can guess that the style does not require much qualitative judgment. The style can be quantified and easily turned into a formula. So now let's look at slime mold, um, which can learn something new and adapt and compare that to how a video game designed by OpenAI can learn and adapt. The question is, can either of them act creatively? Slime mold moves by contracting rhythmically. Generally, whenever slime mold senses cold, it slows down its regular contractions that probably involve calcium reaching a threshold. In an experiment by Shara, Kawa, and Sato, slime mold was put into a container that had a cold side and a warm side, and they put food on the cold side. The slime mold learned to overcome its natural tendency to move away from cold. Only after five training sessions, it could preferentially move toward cold, even if there was no food there anymore. So cold became a sign of food for it. Now, Shirakawa and Seda proposed this hypothetical cybernetic circuit-like regulatory network to explain this associative learning in slime mold. Um, and I think it's really helpful to explore these kind of hypothetical models because they give us sort of a physical mechanism that we can use to imagine how associative learning learns. Associative learning is semiosis. Um, it's associating, it's allowing one thing to stand in for something else. Um, so it's basically an activation inhibition pathway, like the kind of biological switch that Alan Turing wrote about in one of his last papers called Morphogenesis. But Sh Shirakawa and Sato come at it a little bit too much like engineers for me, not like biologists. So I'll be critiquing this model. Let me explain it though first. 
The top left here represents the setup. Nothing's happening yet. And B, top right, shows the normal conditions before any cold or food signal pathways become activated. In this default condition, uh, repressors are on. Red means that it's active. Um, and these are repressing genes that are illustrated here by these little rectangles with P's in them. Um, the, the these genes for making proteins. So these proteins one and two are not being uh, activated. They're being repressed. Now let's look at C bottom left and I'll zoom in and I added some labels so that you can see it better. Um, the cold signal here is inhibited the contraction. That's what slime mold will do if it's uh, sensing cold. And the inputs from cold and food are also now inhibit these repressors um, on the genes for making proteins one and two. So they turn off and the expression of proteins one and two are activated now. So gene one and two are on now and they start to make protein two. And protein two is now accumulating. Green means it's accumulating. Um, now let's look at D on the right. Protein two has built up so much that it begins to sustain its own expression. Um, it's inhibiting repressors one and two now. So now you don't even need to have the food signal working. Also the buildup of protein two somehow, they don't explain how, um, disinhibits this avoidance response to cold. So you've got, with the buildup of protein two, you've got this sort of runaway positive feedback loop. Um, and so now you don't need the food signal to keep going. Um, this model would work if you had a, if you designed a robot with this kind of circuit, it would learn to go toward cold as a sign of food. Um, let me note that in this model, the cold signal and food signal pathways do not directly interact. So you could represent this kind of causality with discrete circuits, but there's a little bit of a problem with this model. One, some unlikely coincidences are not explained. Like wh why does this protein disinhibit this reaction, for example? Um, and two, cybernetic machines can't perform functions that they don't already have a model for. And indeed, this circuit includes pre-programmed genes for, for proteins that somehow already have the function of creating an, an indexical association of food with, with cold, which begs, begs the question, how would that have ever evolved? So, as Oscar, Josh, and I argue in our paper, a living, a living system can adapt to an unknown situation, something that it doesn't have a model for, something it doesn't have a ready-made genetic solution for. And I'll propose a redesign of Shirakawa and Sato's circuit so that it's just an ordinary Turing activation inhibition switch that depends on chemistry, not on a genetic program. So in this way, we can, we can imagine how slime mill might learn so fast. All of this is hypothetical, um, but it's just an exercise to see if we can imagine some kind of mechanisms whereby uh, new index signs and new icon signs can emerge. You probably know about the BZ reaction. It's a kind of Turing switch. Basically, two different chemical reactions inhibit and then activate. For example, let's say that in one reaction, chemical A breaks down chemical B into chemical C. When B is all gone, the first reaction stops, and a second reaction between chemicals D and C takes over. That reaction creates chemical B as a byproduct. So when there's enough B created, the reaction switches back to the first regime. So it's a switch. 
Now try to think of these rings here as signal path pathways for detecting cold and food with various molecules interacting and making byproducts. A pathway might depend on molecules from consumed substances or produced by some organs or other pathways or produced on demand by genes or external factors, whatever. Slime mold might detect food or cold if it has a chemical pathway that is sensitive to cold or that reacts to particles in the air or something. Perhaps when the food signal pathway is not activated, but the cold signal is, the cold signal pathway takes the brown molecule that would lead to a calcium threshold, which is represented here by this little star, thereby slowing down contractions. If these two different pathways are both active at the same time, which would be unusual, they may compete for some molecules where they overlap. And we can imagine that those molecules might run out and one of the pathways might become disabled or inhibited. The cold signal pathway could be disabled if the food signal pathway is activated and gets that blue molecule. We can further imagine that some of the now unused cold signal byproducts, say something like these brown molecules, might feed the food signal pathway to make it go faster. Many pathways share or compete for molecules and or make byproducts used by other pathways. The pos possibility of overlap does exist. So let's also imagine a, situ a situation similar to what Shirakawa and Sato suggest with the buildup of protein two. Let's say that a byproduct in the souped up food signal pathway could build up, creating a reserve of that molecule. See the turquoise molecules are building up, but they're doing so without any gene action. This is just chemistry. Now again, following Shara Kiro and Sato, let's imagine a positive feedback where more turquoise leads to more turquoise, which makes the food signal path pathway become self-activating even without a food signal. And how would, this, how would this work? Well, possibly maybe the production of turquoise molecules could trigger the genetic production of a protein that can mimic the food signal, uh, which makes some sense. Uh, and that would keep the, the pathway going even in, in the absence of actual food signal. That at least makes some sense in terms of reproductive fitness. If slime mold senses a little food, it should keep going in that direction of that index sign, even if the sign fades in and out. Um, and the, the faux food molecule would be a molecular mimic, something that's similar to an actual food molecule, some sort of protein, something, I don't know. Thus, in this roundabout way, cold could temporarily function as a sign of food, as long as cold indirectly makes the food signal pathway engage in positive feedback. Mind you, I'm just speculating here, building off and building out Shirakawa and Saito's mo model to eliminate any unlikely recruitment of genes. But here's the important point. In reality, the signal pathways probably look something more like this a bunch of molecules just floating around. Pathways are not as discrete as they seem when they're illustrated as a cybernetic circuit. When we see molecules floating around like this, this allows us to imagine how easily they can interact with each other if the pathways are both activated at the same time. The point that I'm trying to make here is that biological systems are interactive. Different pathways are more likely to also interfere with each other in ways that don't need to be determined by genes. They could interfere simply due to proximity, competing for the same molecule, like an index sign. Interference could be due to a similarity as with molecular mimicry, and this creates icon signs with or without genes. If the behavior is not encoded in the genes yet, icons and indexes can suffice temporarily to affect behavior. Whereas artificial systems cannot exploit 
the physical qualities of their codes. In biological systems, the relative spatial or relative temporal proximity of signal pathways can affect outcomes. Also, the shapes of molecules can mimic other molecules and affect outcomes. Shirokawa and Sato used a model that requires pre-programmed genes, millions of years of selection pressure to perform the functions needed to make cold into a condition sign for food. Now, how could such program have taken place via natural selection? Because in the wild, food is not found in colder areas. And yet slime mold can become conditioned with just five training sessions to go against their natural tendency to move away from cold. Now we can argue that they do this because they can make use of flexible signs. Now let's look at open AI, uh, their hide and seek game. Uh, now how, how, does, how do these bots learn new things? Well, after hundreds and hundreds of millions of rounds, the AI bots manage to learn to play better and better. They learn to use boxes to hide behind and ramps to get over walls. Eventually, they learn to exploit bugs in the game that the programmers have not anticipated. And Alan Turing once proposed that computers might be creative in the sense that they might exhibit behaviors that surprise the programmer. Such behavior would still be determined by the gene-like code, but not in the way that the programmer had intended. In this game, the seekers learn to jump on top of the boxes and surf them around so that they could get over the hider's walls. And then the hiders learn to throw ramps out of the arena and the seekers learn to throw themselves over walls. These breaking the game innovations seem comparable to the way a biological system might find a molecular mimic for a signal pathway. Maybe the standing on the box code is like enough to the standing on the floor code to mimic it and produce movement. That would be a generalization. If so, then AI can make productive and creative generalizations based on dubious similarities in order to reach a predefined goal. This paper by Baker et al. may claim that hide and seek game leads to emergent agency, but the bots are passively molded by a selection process. They make hundreds of millions of stupid moves before discovering good ones like box surfing by freak accident. Living organisms can learn fast because they tend to create, tend to make creative and productive overgeneralizations using icon signs and misassociations using index signs as self-motivated responses to the qualities of signs in the environment. That's proximity and similarity. They, they, don't they don't make unmotivated random actions that have to be selective, selected in order to be retained. Artificial systems cannot readily exploit the physical associative qualities of their codes, probably because computer codes don't physically interact as bi biological signal pathways do. In addition, open AI game designers may pre be preventing their own progress by relying as they do upon an impoverished metaphor of evolutionary adaptation put forward by Dawkins and Krebs in 1979 that focuses on trying to win the arms race competition. In the distant future, maybe this open AI game will reinvent itself such that the bots decide to cooperate, making some really cool houses or something like that. I'll be impressed if they come up with new goals, not just different ways to reach a predefined goal of killing each other and or merely trying to survive. To summarize, even very simple organisms without brains can learn to do a new task very quickly without millions of years of being trained by reward and punishment. Living systems processes seem radically different from how computers learn. Two, living systems are capable of inventing new goals, not just pursuing a predefined goal in a new way. 
the kind of fitness training done with machine learning doesn't produce that kind of originality. It tends to produce conformity to the common fitness type. Three, living systems use flexible signs to interact with their world. Words. Their, their algorithms are mostly chemical processes, which are not discrete like the lines of code are. Um, signal pathway algorithms can interfere in potentially useful ways. This is probably how they can make useful associations. In other words, how they, they can learn new index signs. Four, in this way, a living system can readily adapt to an unknown situation, something it doesn't have a model for, unlike computers. So I'll conclude by noting that AI is progressing really fast. It can imitate very well. It can optimize toward a predetermined goal, usually survival. But can it create something really original? Not yet, I don't think. Not with the way that computers are presently designed, maybe with some design changes.